Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. It's a true honor to be here. So I'll be talking about static analysis and verification. Now this is a very broad subject in computer science that touches upon many very different areas. Um, but in databases it is uh, of critical importance and it has developed its own specific set of techniques and this is what I'm going to focus about in my talk. So in a nutshell, um, static analysis and verification provide tools for reasoning about correctness and good performance of queries. Okay, now correctness and good performance are obviously um, of great importance to experts, so to people who actually interact directly with databases by sitting down and writing SQL queries. Um, but it is also very important to non-experts and even to the public at large. Why is that? Well, simply because practically everybody interacts with a database through the, the, um, uh, the intermediary of applications, which uh, really provide interfaces to such databases. So typical examples are websites, things like uh, FNAC, uh, Amazon, SNCF, and so on. So take, for example, uh, the FNAC website. So this can be viewed really as a sophisticated interface to a database. Everything that happens on this website is controlled by queries on the database. So if I go to the FNAC website and I look for uh, music by Brassens, uh, this is going to generate a query on the database that is going to produce as output another web page that might show me the CDs by Brassens. Then I might provide as input a particular choice of CD, which again generates a query on the database. The next page might invite me to buy the CD and so on. Okay, now anybody who has spent some time interacting with websites uh, has certainly run into a, a wide array of uh, bugs and problems. Uh, most of them are innocuous, they're really of, of no importance, they are at most uh, mildly annoying. But some of them can be seriously irritating and uh, others can be uh, outright uh, catastrophic. So let's see some examples. Um, so this is a bug that is very common on, uh, on uh, news websites. Duplicate news items. Okay, so this occurs for some reason all the way from small uh, blogs such as this one to uh, websites of major news organizations such as Le Monde. Uh, and uh, well, the reason for that might be that a query that is run against the underlying database returns duplicates. So du it returns duplicate tuples, which may result in duplicate news items. Okay, here's another kind of bug which is, uh, which is more irritating. So you go to a website, you uh, 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 interact with it. Let's say that you try to buy a plane ticket and uh, at some point you just get a blank page, okay? Well, a possible reason for this is that the query returns an empty answer. Here's a variation of that. You don't get a blank page, but instead you just wait forever. You just apparently seemingly wait forever. And uh, a reason for this uh, might be simply that query processing is too slow. Of course, there can be many reasons. It could be the network, but very frequently it has to do with query processing. Uh, here is another type of bug. So you go to, um, to a, a website, uh, you interact with it for a long time, you try to buy a plane ticket, let's say, or a train ticket in this case, uh, and uh, at some point uh, the system just gives up. It says that uh, your request cannot be satisfied and uh, in fact you're better off picking up the phone and calling a human. Okay. So a possible reason for this is a poorly designed workflow of interaction with this uh, website. Good, and here's another example that's uh, uh, catastrophic or exhilarating depending on who you are. This is a snapshot from um, uh, posted on a forum by somebody who managed to buy a free ticket from Ryanair. Okay, I don't know how well you can see this, but this shows a round trip from uh, Dublin to Cork and the total charge is zero euros. Okay, so the person actually posted the sequence of steps that allowed him to do that. Don't worry, it's no longer there. Okay, good. So these are just some examples of things that can go wrong and that uh, have to do really with the interaction with the database. Uh, in this case, a likely problem is a flaw in the workflow design, right? Good, so how can static analysis and verification help? 
Well, static analysis allows you to reason about queries. So for example, it might help check that the query does not return duplicates or that it never returns the empty answer. And verification has to do with reasoning about the workflow, the entire workflow of interaction with the database. Uh, this is kind of an arbitrary uh, separation, but I'm going to use it for the purpose of this talk. Um, good, okay, so uh, I'll begin by talking about static analysis and then I'll move on to verification. I'll spend actually most of the time on static analysis. Okay, so let's step back for a second and uh, contemplate what static analysis is really all about. So let's say that we want to check a property of a query. So what we're really asking for is a static analysis program that given as input a query, answers yes or no, yes if the query has a property and no if it doesn't. Okay, so if we think of the query as reasoning about the data, the static analysis program reasons about the reasoner. So this is a kind of self-reference. We're really asking for a program that analyzes another program. Now, to any computer scientist, uh, this immediately raises uh, red flags. Uh, why? Because uh, self-reference is uh, the prototypical source of undecidability in computer science. So if you think of the halting problem, the most famous of all undecidable problems, this is really a static analysis problem, right? It asks if there is a program, P, that given as input another program, M, and its own input, decides if M halts on I. Okay, so um, the halting problem is, uh, is uh, undecidable. There is no such program P. And the proof of the halting problem is so simple and elegant that it has become the stuff of popular culture. It has been recited on the stage of a Broadway play. It has been put in verse. Um, and um, so I want to show you a fragment of a poem by Geoffrey Pollan from the University of Edinburgh that provides uh, a proof to the, um, the, of, the of the undecidability of the halting problem, so of the non-existence of this uh, uh, program P. So uh, Palam says, well, the truth is that P cannot possibly be because if you wrote it and gave it to me, I could use it to set up a logical bind that would shatter your reason and scramble your mind. You can never find general mechanical means for predicting the acts of computing machines. It's something that cannot be done. So we users must, must find our own bugs. Our computers are losers. Okay, good. So, um, so the actual proof of the uh, halting problem, this uh, logical bind that uh, would uh, shatter your reason and scramble your mind, um, is really uh, of the same flavor as classical logical paradoxes. So just to, to give a typical example, uh, consider the sentence in this box, right? So this is a self-referential sentence because it talks about itself. So is a sentence true or false? Well, if it's true, then it's false because it says so. If it's false, then it's true. So for the halting problem, the um, self-reference is obtained by taking the, the uh, static analysis program, P, and feeding it back into itself, okay? Feeding, giving it as input to itself. Now, I won't go into any details. If uh, some of you attended uh, Gerard Berry's uh, course a couple of years ago, I'm sure you've seen this uh, in a lot of, uh, of detail. But anyway, what this shows is that static analysis in general uh, is not really feasible. Okay, so let's come back to databases. Is this really relevant to query languages such as SQL? Well, that's not obvious. Uh, for one thing, it's not clear how you can get this sort of self-reference that led to the proof of undecidability of the halting problem, right? SQL doesn't run on SQL, it runs on databases. Um, the static analysis program cannot necessarily be fed to itself because it's not an SQL program and so on. So let's look at some um, um, uh, static analysis problems for SQL. So let's begin with uh, very fundamental question, and apparently a simple one. So is the answer to a query queue always empty? Now this is a problem that's important in its own right, but it's also important because many other problems can be reduced to it. 
Okay, so let's, let's try to see if we can figure this out. So if we start with uh, a simple query, this uh, question seems easy enough. So uh, this is a query on uh, uh, a fragment of the uh, movie database that Serge uh, used in several of his cl cl classes. And here we have an immediate um, inconsistency, right? Uh, the condition of the where clause requests the theater to be Leal and Odeon at the same time, but Leal is not Odeon, so this cannot be satisfied. The answer is always empty. Okay, now things get a little bit uh, harder if we look at a more complex database that has a more complicated schema, maybe with constraints, with keys, with referential integrity constraints, and so on. Now, don't try to follow the details here. It's just a more complicated schema. And here's a query on this schema. So is this always empty? Well, I don't know. It's not, it's not as obvious as the previous query. But if you take a look at it for five minutes, uh, you can see that, in fact, the condition of the, uh, of the where clause is in contradiction with the constraints of the database. So this does, in fact, always produce the empty answer. OK, so this seems promising. Maybe there is a program that can test for emptiness of SQL queries. Well, it turns out that not only this is not possible, no such program exists, but the halting problem itself can be reduced to the, to the SQL query emptiness problem. OK, so in other words, if I'm given a Turing machine M with an input I, I can build a query, an SQL query, so that M halts on I if and only if the query is non-empty for some database. So this means that the SQL query emptiness problem is undecidable. And it turns out that many, many other problems are also undecidable for SQL. For example, are two programs equivalent? Or can a program Q be simplified relative to various criteria? Or does a query return duplicate tuples? And in fact, practically any non-trivial property is undecidable for SQL queries. OK, so, um, uh, so this means that uh, static analysis is basically hopeless for SQL. So what, what, do, what do we do next? Well, a uh, sensible next step is to look for a class of simpler but still very useful queries that uh, are amenable to static analysis. And uh, fortunately, there is such a set of queries a very simple set, very useful, and extremely well behaved with respect to static analysis. It's called the conjunctive queries. Now, uh, I believe that you've heard about the conjunctive queries in Serge's class and also in Moshe Vardy's uh, lecture. So just to, to, to review, what, what are these conjunctive queries? Well, in terms of SQL, they are uh, simple SQL queries in which the where condition consists of a conjunction of equalities among attributes and constants. Uh, in terms of logic, this, in terms of first order logic, this corresponds to the fragment that uses only existential quantification and conjunction. Okay, so here's a simple example using again the movie database. So this is a conjunctive SQL query that uh, finds the theaters showing some movie by Godard. Okay, good. So how about query emptiness? So for conjunctive queries, query emptiness is, is really easy to check. And this is because the only uh, inconsistency that you can get comes from trying to uh, force two constants which are not equal to be equal. Okay, and this is very easily detected. Okay, good. So let's look at some more uh, interesting uh, static analysis questions. But before we do that, I would like to uh, note a very useful fact, which is the following. If uh, assuming that a query is consistent, a conjunctive query is non-empty, it's possible to represent it very simply and intuitively as a pattern of tuples using variables and constants. So here's an example. If we look again at the previous query, so theaters showing movies by Godard, I can represent this by tuples, by a pattern of tuples in the following way. The answer consists of the theaters A, such that A shows a title T, and T is directed by Godard. OK, good. So we're going to call this uh, tuple that describes the answer to the query uh, the 
tuple answer, the answer tuple of the uh, pattern. Okay, so A is, in this case, the answer tuple of the pattern. Okay, good, so this provides a very, very uh, simple, intuitive description of what the query does. But here is a, a, a disturbing observation. If I look at this set of queries, if somebody gave me a picture of this set of queries, without any caption, without explaining anything about what this, what, what this is about. I would have no way of knowing if this is a query of it or if it is a database. Okay, this could be a query or it could be a database. So this is an unsettling thought. A query is a database. So does this mean that I can take a query and apply it to another query? Well, this immediately raises, again, the specter of uh, self-reference. And with it, the uh, corresponding uh, red flags, right? Good, so uh, the question is, is this really dangerous in the context of conjunctive queries? Does it lead to trouble? And it turns out that not only does not lead to problems, but this uh, ambiguity, this, uh, this confusion de genre between Query and database turns out to provide an extremely powerful tool for static analysis. So let me illustrate this with a couple of static analysis problems, which are very important ones. So let's look at query equivalence. So suppose we're given two conjunctive queries, P and Q, and we want to know if they're equivalent. What does equivalence mean? It means that for every database, the answer to P is the same as the answer to Q. Okay, so how can we test equivalence? Well, the definition suggests that we must look at every database and test if P and Q give the same answers. But of course, we cannot do that because there are infinitely many databases. So the test for equivalence circumvents this problem in an ingenious way. It does the following. So it says, first take Q, the query Q, and look at it as a database. Now apply P to Q. P is a query, Q is a database, you can apply P to Q. Good. So if P and Q are equivalent, the result of evaluating P on Q must contain the answer tuple of Q. So the particular tuple that specifies the answer to Q. And conversely, if you take P and view it as a database and you apply Q to P, the result must contain the answer tuple to P. Okay, let's look at a simple example. So suppose the database is a binary relation, so a graph. And suppose P and Q have the following patterns. So P looks for the pairs X, Y in the, uh, of nodes in the graph, um, such that Y is reachable from X by a path of length two. Q looks for the X, Y, such that there are pa there's a path from X to Y going through a node B, and also a path from X to Y going through a node C. So are these two equivalent? Well, let's apply the test. First, let's uh, look at P as a database and apply Q to P. I claim that XY is obtained in the result. Why? Because I can map the XY of Q to the XY of P, and I can map B of C to A. And conversely, if I take P and apply it to Q, once again, I get XY in the result. Why? Because the XY of P can be mapped to the XY of Q, and A can be mapped to B or to C. So these two are equivalent. Good, okay. So let's push this, uh, let's take this uh, one step further by taking into account also constraints which might uh, hold in the database. So in other words, we're looking again at the equivalence uh, problem, but now we have the additional information that the database satisfies some constraints, sigma. Okay, so how does a test work in this case? Well, it uses the same uh, type of approach um, in the following way. So take P and Q and look at them once again as databases and now force them to satisfy sigma. Take the result and look at the result in queries, P prime and Q prime, and now apply the old equivalence test. Okay. So I went a little bit fast uh, through this part. How do I force a database to satisfy sigma? Well, this is done by a 
procedure which is called the chase. It's a very, very powerful, useful procedure which is used all over the place in static analysis. So I'll illustrate it with a simple example. Here's a query on the same movie database. So uh, this looks for theaters, A, such that A shows a title by Godard, and at the same time, a title where Brigitte Bardot is an actress. You might guess which the title is, but it's not important. Um, OK, good. And let's say that the database satisfies these functional dependencies. So first of all, theater determines title, which means that each theater shows only one title. And second, title determines director, which means that um, a movie has only one director. So the chase works as follows, as follows. If you look at the two tuples in schedule, they have the same theater. So the title must be the same. B must be equal to C. So C can be changed to B. And now if you look at the two tuples in movie, they have the same title. So the director in the second uh, row has to also be equal to Godard. And as a, as a side benefit, the first tuples in movie and schedule are now redundant, so the query can actually be simplified by eliminating them. OK, good. So this is an example of, uh, of the chase. All right. So uh, conjunctive queries turns out to be extremely well behaved with respect to static analysis. These were just some examples of things that can be tested, but there are many, many more. In some sense, it's a paradise of static analysis. In fact, uh, they're so well behaved that one might wonder if there's anything that's undecidable of, about conjunctive queries. So how far does this uh, good news go? Well, it turns out that perhaps surprisingly, there are some things that are undecidable about conjunctive queries. Uh, and here's an example. It's called the implication problem for conjunctive query inclusion. So the problem is the following. Suppose I'm given n inclusions among conjunctive queries. PI is included in QI. Here inclusion means that the answer to PI is always included in the answer to QI. Okay? And suppose that I want to know if these inclusions imply another inclusion, P is included in Q. So it turns out that this problem is undecidable. And uh, the proof is by reduction uh, from a well-known undecidable problem from algebra, which is called the word, the word problem for finite monoids. Interestingly, there are some uh, questions for which decidability itself is open. And I want to mention one of them. It's called the determinacy problem. So the question is, is if the answer to a conjunctive query P determines the answer to another query Q. So in other words, suppose I have a database, and suppose I have the answer to query P on this database, and now I want to answer query Q. So the question is, if the, is if the answer to P always provides enough information to answer Q. So here are some simple examples. Suppose, again, the database is a directed graph. And suppose P uh, looks for the nodes x, y, such that there's a pass of lengths 2 from x to y. And Q looks for the pairs x, y, such that there's a pass of lengths 4 from x to y. So does P provide enough information to answer Q? Yes, clearly, simply because 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now, if uh, Q instead looks for pass of length 3, then P no longer provides enough information. And here's a more um, um, uh, tricky example. Suppose that P now co consists of two queries, P3 and P4, where P3 looks for paths of length 3, and P4 looks for paths of length 4. And Q looks for paths of length 5. So do P3 and P4 provide enough information to answer Q? Well, the answer is less obvious. But it turns out that, uh, yes, P3 and P4 do provide info enough information to answer Q. OK, so is there a general algorithm that can test if some conjunctive query determines another conjunctive query? Well, we don't know. This is open. Decidability of this question remains open. OK, good. So let's see where we are so far. So we've seen that SQL, the full SQL, is too powerful for decidable static analysis, for complete decidable static analysis. And on the other hand, conjunctive queries are a very simple and useful set of SQL queries that are extremely well behaved with respect to static analysis. 
So can we stop here? Can we be happy performing static analysis on conjunctive queries? Well, uh, it turns out that this is really not enough. And the reason is that static analysis of complex queries that go well beyond conjunctive queries is really essential to performance. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by a complex query, I want to show an example. So this is a query that was uh, provided to me by Bill McKenna, who is a, a query optimization guru. And uh, uh, I want to show you the first few lines of this query. So please take a look at the cursor here. Okay, it has barely moved. The reason is that this query has 23,000 lines of code. Now, it was not written by uh, an expert who sat down and wrote SQL queries. It was produced by a tool. But uh, nonetheless, this is an extremely complex query, and um, uh, we have to deal with, uh, with such complexity. So what can be done in uh, practical query processing beyond conjunctive queries? So here are some examples of what can be done. You can do static analysis on simple building blocks. Um, so for example, you can take a complex SQL query, such as the one you've just seen, and you can look at its um, uh, evaluation plan, let's say it's algebraic expression, and um, try to perform static analysis on subqueries, some of which may be, in fact, conjunctive queries. So, for example, you might uh, be able to tell that a certain subquery always returns the empty answer. And with some luck, this can result in considerable simplification of the query. Okay. Uh, another example of very, of very useful things to do in static analysis for improving performance is to apply rewrite rules for simplifying queries. Now, you've seen examples of this in Serge's lectures. A typical example is early selection or pushing selection. So uh, this basically uh, says that uh, selection should be applied as early as possible so that you don't get unnecessarily large intermediate results. OK. Um, there are many other heuristics that can be used and that I won't have time to, to, to really describe. So there are much more rewrite rules, things like subquery decorrelation, detected common subqueries, view unfolding, uh, and many other things. So these heuristics turned out to have dramatic impact on complex queries. So as one example, if you look at the uh, uh, 23,000 line query that I've just shown you, um, static analysis in this case improved performance by 95%. Okay, good. So, um, so far, we talked exclusively about relational databases, but of course, uh, static analysis is important beyond relational databases, and in particular for XML. Now, the questions for XML um, are uh, to some extent similar, so you're interested in things like uh, emptiness, uh, equivalence, and so on. Some questions are qualitatively different. Uh, for example, uh, questions that have to do with type checking. And Serge mentioned one of those questions in his talk. The techniques are uh, quite different, and the main reason for this is that uh, XML is much closer to tree automata than to uh, first-order logic. So XML schema, which is the uh, language for specifying the structure of XML, is closely related to tree automata. And DEX query, which is a standard query language for XML, is closely related to tree transducers. So uh, as a consequence, the techniques for XML are a mix of logic and automata theory. Now, an interesting twist is due to the presence of data. And this is that uh, classical automata on finite alphabets are not always sufficient in this case. In fact, in some situations, you need to look at automata on infinite alphabets. And this uh, raises considerably, considerable check technical challenges and in fact, a lot of the research in recent years in this area uh, has um, provided deep results, deep interesting results that have to do precisely with automata on infinite alphabets. 
Okay, good. So we talked about uh, static analysis, and now let's move to verification. Now, uh, static analysis, as I described it, has to do with analyzing queries in isolation. In contrast, verification has to do with reasoning about the entire workflow of an application. So the uh, sequence of steps in the interaction with the application. So for example, um, uh, um, a property that we might want to verify that has to do with workflow is uh, the following. If we look again at the Ryanair website, we might want to verify that no free tickets can be sold. Okay, so let's try to uh, uh, formulate uh, what this verification problem is, what automatic verification really means. So we would like, what we would like to have is a verifier, a program, that takes as input a specification of the application and the property to be verified, and outputs yes if the property is satisfied, and no if it's not. In addition, if the property is violated, it would be very nice to get a counterexample that is a sequence, an example of a sequence of steps that leads to a violation. So, uh, for example, in the Ryanair case, if, uh, if uh, the property that no free tickets can be sold is violated, we would like to actually have an example of a sequence of steps that allows us to buy a free ticket. Okay, good. So, um, to, um, to formalize this, uh, we need to understand what the specification consists of and how properties are being formulated. So let's look at specifications first. So um, as I discussed previously, applications such as, such as uh, websites are really interactive systems whose behavior is completely controlled by queries on the database. So a natural high-level specification for such system consists of a first-order control. Now, what do I really mean by a first-order control? So the control has to specify the following. So when an input arrives into the system, the control must say, first of all, how the database has changed in reaction to the input. And second, it must specify the output that is produced by the system in response to the input. And a run of the system is going to be a sequence of consecutive inputs and outputs together with the corresponding databases. Good. So how about uh, uh, properties? How do we specify properties? Well, let's look at, at an example. So suppose that we want to specify this property about Ryanair every delivered ticket has been previously paid for in the correct amount. So this is a property that has to do with the runs of the system. And what we want to say is that if at some point a ticket has been delivered, then sometime in the past, the ticket must have been paid in the correct amount. So to specify this, we really need to, to do two things. So first of all, we have to connect these events temporally. We have to specify the temporal connection between the events. And this can be done using um, uh, uh, temporal logic operators. Uh, so things like um, always, eventually, uh, previously, and so on. So these are operators that are used in a logic that is referred to as linear time temporal logic. So in our case, what we want to say is the following. It's always the case that if at some point the ticket is delivered, then at some previous moment in time, the ticket must have been paid. Okay, so this takes care of the temporal connection. Now, once this is done, we actually have to refine the definition of these events. We have to say what these events really mean. So we have to define these events in terms of inputs, outputs, and the database. So, uh, for example, for ticket delivered, it makes sense to define it as follows. There is an output called deliver that delivers a ticket X. Okay, so the ticket delivered is translated, interpreted as deliver X. And for ticket paid, uh, a possibility is the following. So ticket paid means that there is an input pay that pays the ticket X in the amount Y. 
And uh, y is the correct amount as indicated by the database. So price is a database relation, pay is, uh, is an input. So this results in a language for properties, which uh, consists of first order formula as building blocks that are connected using temporal operators. Okay, good. So now the formal verification problem is, uh, is clear. We want a verifier that takes as input a specification as a first order control and the property as uh, in this language of first order formulas augmented with temporal operators. And we want uh, to know if the property is satisfied and if not, to get a counterexample. Okay, good. So, uh, so it turns out uh, as uh, uh, one might expect that uh, uh, the problem is undecidable in general. Okay, so the verification problem is certainly harder than the static analysis problem and even very simple questions are undecidable for full uh, first order logic. So, um, um, so, so in order to get uh, positive results, we must come up with restrictions. Okay, so the good news is that uh, if you pick the right package of restrictions, it is possible to automatically verify significant classes of applications. Okay, now the techniques that are involved are a mix of logic and automata theory. Good, so um, of course one can look at the same sort of uh, uh, question for beyond relational databases. So for example, for systems that uh, are based on uh, XML. So you've just seen in uh, Serge's lecture um, that active XML is a very powerful mechanism for specifying workflows. And uh, the same sort of um, uh, verification problem can be posed in the context of a workflow specified by active XML. So here we have as input a specification as an active XML system. Um, the uh, property has to be specified somewhat differently, and I'll get to that in a second. And uh, again, we want to know if uh, uh, the, XML, the active XML system specifies a, uh, satisfies the property. Okay, so how do we specify properties of active XML systems? Well, if we look at the previous example, so every delivered ticket has been previously paid in the correct amount. The uh, 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 events that we're interested in are exactly the same. The temporal connection between them is exactly the same. What changes is the actual definition of the events. So previously we defined ticket delivered and ticket paid as first order formulas. Uh, now it would make sense to use instead tree patterns that apply to the XML document. Okay, so this is an example of uh, tree patterns that might be used to define um, these two events, ticket delivered and ticket paid. Okay, and uh, so now we have the uh, 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 static anal the uh, verification problem for active XML. The good news once again is that with the right package of restrictions, it is possible to automatically verify significant classes of applications. Okay, good. So, um, so we've seen that static analysis and verification in databases are practically essential. They're intellectually challenging. When you do static analysis and verification, you quickly run against fundamental limitations of computing, which means that there's a lot that simply cannot be done. And what can be done involves often deep mathematics and in particular, an elegant mix of logic and automata theory. Now, of course, what I covered in this talk was just a very limited overview of some basic uh, questions and ideas. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? There are many, many static analysis problems and verification problems that I couldn't even mention. In particular, an important aspect that I couldn't uh, address at all is the wide array of techniques that are available to deal with limitations. So these include uh, things like sophisticated heuristics, 
approximation techniques, abstraction, and so on. So, um, okay, so uh, hopefully this uh, stimulated your curiosity. There's still much, much more to learn about this fascinating area. Um, I would like to finally mention that uh, the work on verification uh, is based on research done um, at UC San Diego with my colleague Alin Deutsch and the rest of the database team at, and at INRIA and the Cachon with Serge Abitaboul and Luc Segoufan. Okay, thank you. <laughs>